Aloha, everyone, and welcome to our 2024 OLP series in online language pedagogy. Thank you all very much for joining us. We appreciate you taking the time to be here live, and hello to everyone on the archive. And this series is a little bit of a different approach than prior OLP series we've done in the past, whereas we wanted to have a forum where experts could come in and discuss their thoughts and viewpoints on some of the hot topics around teaching the Russian language online. And I have to say, quite honestly, this has perhaps been my favorite series that I have facilitated so far. And a warm thank you to all of the participants who've made this happen. And our panelists have been fantastic. We've had fantastic conversations for the past several days. Now, sadly, this is our last live session. Uh, however, at the very end of the session, I will be going over things you can do to earn the digital badge for participating in the series. And I do hope that many of you will pursue that. It's a great thing to have, and you'll be able to put that up wherever you might feel like you want to put that up. Um, so I want to start off with just having our panelists go around and introduce themselves a little bit uh, for those who maybe weren't here for the past two sessions. And we'll talk a little bit about, uh, today we're talking about learner engagement, especially in the online world, how that can sometimes be a little challenging, but our experts have a lot to say on the topic and we're looking forward to getting into it. So that being said, um, Olga, if I could please start with you, if you could please introduce yourself and tell our audience a bit about you. Yes, hello everyone. My name is Olga Klimova and I teach at the University of Pittsburgh in the Slavic department. Uh, I'm also the director of the Russian language program there, and I teach uh, different levels of Russian language, but also supervise the team, the teaching team, and uh, mentor graduate students, graduate TAs. Uh, in the summer, I direct the summer, uh, Russian summer program through StarTalk for high school students. So we've been doing this for, I think, since 2016. And uh, uh, my experience with online teaching, both uh, uh, I have it both through the Star Talk because our Star Talk classes, even though in the summer we usually have a face to face uh, three weeks summer camp, then we have uh, several uh, several weeks or several months, if not a semester, couple of semesters of online teaching uh, as a, with all the students. And uh, at Pete, we our elementary and intermediate Russian are hybrid language classes. So we use both uh, synchronous and asynchronous uh, activities and assessments there throughout the semester. And this year, we also have them hybrid as if we accept online students as well to like regular uh, to regular students. And I'm also the president of the American Co uh, Council of Teachers of Russian. Where, and we uh, also organize a, a lot of different professional development uh, activities and events for teachers and instructors of Russian. Thank you. Thank you for that. Much appreciated. Uh, Heather, if you don't mind going next, please, to tell the audience a little bit about yourself and your background, please. Sure. Um, thank you again for having me. It's uh, great to be here. My name is Heather Rice. I am an assistant professor of instruction at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, I, I think I am here mostly because I got to develop from the ground up uh, a fully online Russian language course um, that we've been offering at our university for um, since 2017. And uh, recently we were awarded a grant by the um, Department of Education, an IRS grant, International Research and Studies, uh, to transform our online materials into uh, an OER, which is really exciting for us. We already have Czech and Croatian OER. So after this, we'll have like the major branches of the Slavic languages represented, which is, which is fun. Um, my specialization in graduate school was in linguistics. So um, that's a, just a fun thing for us. I did phonetics and phonology, and um, I focus a lot on that in my classes. Uh, I'm also um, on the board of directors of ACTR, so I do get to see Olga a lot. Um, and let's see, uh, I'm the regional chair for the Olympiad of Spoken Russian, um, that's also connected with ACTR. And that's it. Fantastic. Everyone loves a good OER, so thank you again for sharing that with us. And Evgeny, if you could please introduce yourself. Thank you. Oh, Heather, congratulations on the grant. Looking forward to seeing the new OER. We need more of them, but I know 
it's so much work. <laughs> um, I'm a teaching professor of Russian, director of the Russian program and director of the Center for Languages and Cultures at uh, the University of Southern California. Oh, and I'm former, former since everybody's talking about ACTR today, a former board member of this wonderful organization that everyone who's teaching Russian should be part of. Excellent, and always appreciated. And Larissa, if you could please introduce yourself, please. Well, I'm a, I'm a multilingual uh, learning uh, specialist at the public schools in Washington State uh, with a bilingual world language, Russian and English endorsements. And my area of expertise is teaching heritage language speakers of all level of, of proficiency and ages. Um, I taught a grant funded program through OSPI uh, in Washington State. Um, and right now I'm proudly represent University of Washington Language Lab, where I created a grant funded Start Talk Russian language course for high school students. And um, I also work with uh, teachers and families. Uh, for making content comprehensible for bilingual students of all levels and backgrounds. Uh, I provide consultation, create learning plans for students' families. Um, since everybody mentioned OER, um, it's a great resource. And recently I'm involved in one project um, creating some word language lessons. And of course, I had chosen my, uh, my native language. Uh, the one that I'm expertise in is Russian. So some lessons that I'm working on will be available on uh, on the platform too very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Much appreciated to all of our panelists. And again, thank you very much for taking the time to join us live for this session. And as I can say, I, this has really been one of my most favorite OLP sessions I've ever facilitated. And all of the interactions between all of you have made this amazing. So thank you again. And we're getting into a topic that I am really passionate about as an online educator, and that is learner interaction. And it can definitely be challenging in a face-to-face -face classroom even, but online it can have a little bit of extra layers of challenge um, whenever you're trying to get students to, to join in and collaborate with each other. So we'll start with the first question, and that is what makes the Russian language challenging to use? when fostering learner to learner interaction. And Olga, if you'd like to start, that would be fantastic. So I think that first of all, what makes it a little bit more difficult in general to teach and especially when you try to create activities where students have to talk to, to one another, it's the fact that Russian belongs to the group number three of difficulty, right? In terms of difficult languages. So it means that it takes much longer time for students to to get to the level of the proficiency where they comfortably uh, can express their ideas. And what I've noticed is that uh, that's one of the challenges because students want to participate in some activities. They want to express their ideas. They want to participate in a dialogue but they find themselves not being able to do this, especially at the level of beginning, like in, in novice students and maybe low intermediate, where they start running off vocabulary or their grammar becomes, uh, takes such a deep then they cannot understand each other. So I think that's like explaining that uh, to them that no, if you ever had experience with Spanish, let's say, or maybe a German or French uh, languages, uh, you should not expect it to be progressing as fast as maybe in these languages. So, and that's what also makes it a little bit more challenging. And I think that um, sometimes even pronunciations and uh, uh, pronunciations, intonations, stress marks because uh, Russian can be challenging. You uh, change the stress mark. You put the stress mark in the incorrect syllable. Uh, it can, can completely create a different meaning <laughs> of the same word, right? So sometimes this is a challenge and we need to emphasize the correct pronunciation, the correct <laughs> stress, right? Stress marks uh, on our syllable and just encouraging students uh, to use uh, spontaneous speech. So I think because they realize that Russian is a little bit 
especially English, uh, native English speakers, Russian is uh, so different, especially grammar with case system, conjugations. So uh, they, uh, very often my students are hesitant to even like try to, to, to speak because they're afraid of making mistakes and they, they want to be perfect. <laughs> they want to, to make no mistakes. And because of this, they're hesitant to to interact, to participate in dialogue. So, so there are a lot of things that uh, makes it a little bit more challenging <laughs> to create uh, successful activities where they have to talk to one another or to even talk in a small group because they might feel uncomfortable uh, with uh, because of their level of proficiency. I agree it's really important to set the expectation that a level three language is going to be more challenging for, say, a native English speaker who might have taken Spanish in the past and was able to use the language quickly. So I definitely think there's a lot of value in that. And it's challenging to lower that effective filter, but I think we try our best. Uh, Larissa, if I could please ask you the same question. What do you think makes the Russian language challenging to use when you're fostering learner-to-learner -learner interaction? Yes, I uh, agree with Olga. Uh, of course, uh, it's not very close languages, uh, English and Russian, and especially uh, the major things like uh, in English, we you look at the sentence as subject, verb, and object structure. Um, so it's critical for meaning to uh, have this word order correct. On the contrast, the Russian language relies heavily on the endings of the words, uh, such as noun cases, verb conjugations, to convey this meaning. And English speakers often struggle with this when learning Russian because they not only make mistakes, they even only hear kind of the subject verb, verb object. So this is how they get used to understand. Uh, so it's it's hard to uh, re rewrite their um, understanding and kind of uh, the uh, brain too. So um, they focus on word order and overlook the importance of the endings, um, both in speaking and listening. Uh, the example that I'd like to uh, show students is the uh, yeah, the simple sentence about kalapkas yela lisa. So uh, the English speaker might mistaken, mistakenly uh, thinking uh, that uh, kalapka is actually the feminine subject performing an action rather than the object. Uh, so even if students have learned the grammar rules, without this vocabulary, solid vocabulary of the, to know the base words, like to know what kalabok is. Um, it's the meaning uh, lost. So they misinterpret the sentence. So here's like the arrow um, in a communication you can see here could be of misunderstanding. Um, and pronunciation, of course, like Olga mentioned, uh, pronunciation too, uh, you have to pronounce endings very clearly. Uh, and pronounce the stress in, in consonants. So pronunciation could be crucial, right? When there is like uh, kalapka, e, uh, in other words, karopka, right? It's like very, very, there's a different uh, stress pattern and then in one, uh, one consonant and then completely different meaning. So um, you can actually see this misunderstanding visually when I uh, ask students after I, I read this sentence, to, to show the picture what the meaning of the sentence is. And sometimes they do uh, show this, like the, the box is eating the fox instead of the <laughs> the meaning is that, yes, uh, Kalabok is the gingerbread man. Um, so, and it's kind of, we uh, look at this and laugh at this, but also kind of it makes the point of uh, really paying attention, really paying attention and, and teaching vocabulary, right? Before uh, before students can can speak freely. Um, I also noticed um, another, the difference between heritage and non-heritage uh, speakers when they involved in the communication uh, in with each other. Um, I noticed that actually the non-heritage speakers, um, when they make mistake, they're not so uh, stressed about this. So most of them, yes, they don't want to, to, especially teenagers, for example, but they're very proud to be like, you know, novice meet and they have, they can make phrases and they're very like, they celebrate it. 
um, on the opposite, the heritage speakers, they kind of feel the shame of uh, making the mistakes. And very often, like, uh, you know, uh, in the communities, in the families, even though, of course, everybody wants to, you know, uh, teach and correct mistakes all the time, kind of overcorrections all the time, and not listening to the message, and then kind of even a shaming, like, oh, you cannot speak Russian. And um, not, every, again, it's not in every family, of course, no, but I've seen this a lot of students not speaking because they're afraid of make mistakes in their language, even though the level of the language is much higher than the uh, non-heritage speakers, but they just kind of feel this pressure of this heritage language, the family language, everybody made uh, mistakes and laughing and how you pronounce it in, incorrectly. So it takes time to start thinking about the language um, as a language learning, right? So this is another skills that they should have. Uh, so go away from this shaming uh, culture. Uh, but heritage speakers will understand uh, the sentence, Lisa, um, because they know, you know, this is one of the stories uh, that they heard um, growing up. So one of the first stories, probably their grandmother or mother read to them, uh, but not necessarily they would uh, explain why that's the meaning. They just know like, yeah, because they know the content and vocabulary words involved with this story. So uh, kind of to wrap it up, um, I would say there are two uh, things here that a complexity of Russian grammar, of course, and like limited active vocabulary that students have. Uh, then the pronunciation challenges, the influence of English, uh, and of course, this, this psychological fear of making mistakes in their own uh, home language, all of these things contribute to the difficulties in, in this learner-to-learner -learner interaction in Russian language. You made a really good point about heritage speakers feeling extra self-conscious, not wanting to make a mistake. And it is really important that we do all we can to try to lower that effective filter. But that's a really good point and something to think about, especially if we work with heritage and non-heritage, that some of them might be very afraid of making mistakes. So we want to try to be as open and welcoming as possible. Thank you so much. Uh, Evgeny, again, same question. What makes the Russian language challenging to use when you're fostering learner-to-learner -learner interaction, especially in the online space? Sure. Um, I, I like that Larissa brought up that um, this notion that we need to react to message for the meaning first and then to form second. I think we'll have time to talk about this later, giving feedback and what we actually react to. But I really want to emphasize that um, um, correcting students should should not come at the price of like them feeling discomfortable uh discomfort and uncomfortable um and uh, something that we talked about in the first session the alphabet the difference between the non non latin alphabet certainly slows down uh or makes it harder uh for them to read and also to uh to write uh so if they were studying spanish or you know, Italian, they could start, you know, they familiarity with letters uh, wouldn't be a problem. So they could start typing and interacting with, with each other via chat or um, text messages right away. So that um, that certainly is an issue. I, I wonder how, how much of a help, um, like, cell phone keyboard is is if if that's kind of a helping students because it's relatively easy to set it up so typing on the phone might be actually easier and i know some students actually sometimes type their homework on on the phone because they don't need to have stickers and you know a different layout of the keyboard so that could actually be an interesting solution um, that they will um, they can use to to speed up the uh, writing practice, but I would say the alphabet, uh, different alphabet, is certainly one big uh, issue, especially for obviously for novice learners. 
The difference in alphabet would definitely be a challenge, especially for those who are coming in with no Russian background and they're having to get used to something brand new. So that could definitely be a huge challenge as well. Thank you for that. And uh, Heather, same question. What do you think makes the Russian language challenging to use, especially whenever you're fostering online learner to learner interaction? Um, yeah, this is a really good question. Uh, and I kind of have two, I guess, parts to the answer. And the first is, is not really specific to Russian, I don't think. Um, and that's just, especially online learning, um, it really depends on the mode of learning, whether or not it's asynchronous or synchronous. Um, I say that because with our own online class, we're mostly asynchronous. We do have one synchronous meeting a week, um, but interaction is necessary, right? Even from like the very beginning. And so how to foster that, how to like get that to happen when students are running up against these incredible challenges that my colleagues just mentioned um, about learning Russian, overcoming uh, difficulties like with learning new alphabet and you know a new sound system, new grammar, all of that um, is just being online. And so for asynchronous, you know, it's a, a lot has to do with you know difference in um, scheduling, uh, making sure that students can like find uh, the time and the like the ability and thank goodness like we all have Zoom now like students can meet up on Zoom very easily uh, and carry out different tasks that I might give them um, in the synchronous environment. Uh, it's it can be really challenging because you know you see everybody on the screen, you're seeing everybody's faces and to get students to start interacting with each other when they're having to like overcome all of these challenges that like my colleagues were mentioning um, can be really difficult. So I try to like having been through this myself, you know, my, my colleagues here are um, native speakers and they are super sympathetic uh, instructors. And I can tell you all that I was one of those students who never wanted to make a mistake. I was so intimidated by Russian, um, but I also fell in love with it. I love the way it sounded. I, I thought it was this, you know, great um, kind of puzzle uh, to, to work through. Um, and so knowing how I started, I really try to um, take that approach with my students and to, and to be encouraging and sympathetic and, um, you know, go in and, and tell them that, yes, it is, you know, it is a, a, a tier three language. It is more difficult. It's, you know, it, it looks so new, so strange, so, so foreign, right? How are we going to deal with this? Um, but I I dive in right on the first day. They can't read Zdrastvuitya, how to say hello, but they all learn within the first 15 minutes. You know, we sound it out, everybody repeats it, and everybody introduces themselves to everybody else in the room within the first uh, 10 minutes. This is in person and online. Um, and so we break the ice immediately. And, um, you know, I, I try to share my own stories about how uh, that was the first word I heard in Russian. I thought I'm never going to be able to reproduce that. And I tell them, yes, you are actually going to be able to do it and you're going to do it right now. Um, and so online, um, what's actually great about online is that um, after the synchronous meeting, after we've practiced saying hello and, and nice to meet you and, and they feel pretty good about it, the very first homework assignment is to actually post, like I, I said, uh, our last meeting that we use Canvas um, for our online courses. I actually have everyone for their first assignment post a discussion recording of themselves, introducing themselves again, just like they did in our synchronous meeting, saying, hello, my name is, and nice to meet you. So what's nice is that at home, they can practice as much as they want before they upload this video to the discussion board. And then the follow-up to this is that they have to watch at least three videos and post replies to these videos saying, nice to meet you. So I agree with all of my colleagues what they said, that it is incredibly difficult given the alphabet, given the completely like different grammar that, that we're used to um, in English. 
it's, it's incredibly intimidating. Um, and so I try to get them started like from day one, um, and just break that ice, laugh, and just really encourage them at every turn that it is okay to make mistakes. Yes, it's scary, um, but we're, you know, we're in this together. I love how you talked about breaking the ice because that is just so important to help students feel at ease with each other. And ultimately that helps build community too, which is a huge plus. Thank you for that. And then our next question is talking about how we've used technology or online resources to overcome some of those challenges. Uh, Larissa, if you could maybe talk a little bit about how you've used technology or maybe some online resources to overcome the challenges that the students face when working together. Okay, yes, I'm just, uh, yeah, I'm thinking where to start. I think uh, Heather already mentioned some things that some strategies that we can use from the day one. Uh, for um, to start the communication. Um, also, it's nice to have this kind of inquiry cycle when they have to figure out uh, what letters is are this and find some words that are like um, international words or sounding the same or words like a you know kino something that very close to. So that uh, will help to break the ice. Um, if we talk about uh, technology in online resources, I'm just again thinking about my uh, my lessons, and um, I always start uh, with um, discussions and something that students observe, and then they will uh, tell what it is, and then um, uh, talk uh, together about this and come up with some conclusions. So there's some kind of routines there too. Um, another thing uh, that um, at home they can use some grammar drills, uh, listening practice. Um, again, a platform that I use for this uh, asynchronous course and synchronous too is a formative and you can actually record your answers there. Uh, you can record videos, you can uh, record um, answers to the questions. You can listen to that. So listen um, and uh, record your answer. So you don't have to even have a reading and writing involved at first, just uh, like repeating what it says there. Um, so it's um, it helped to practice that. Um, and uh, with grammar and uh, noun cases, verb conjugation, as beneficial to always have this practice, practice and incorporate some drills um, with listening to not, just um, you know, reading but listening to like even with the letters of alphabet, right? You listen to this and then find the correct one. Uh, for um, non-heritage speakers, especially spending adequate time on phonics is uh, crucial too from the beginning, um, which it's not always liked by the older students in a in a high school, for example. They don't like to spend time working on phonics, but giving some examples. Uh, how important it is uh, when this one sound makes the whole difference in the meaning, um, then um, encouraging them in a playful way to uh, um, to do that. S some things like very famous Duolingo for uh, the beginners, they can practice that too, um, you know, using the alphabet letters and sounds. And um, as I notice, it's perfecting itself. So it's getting better with time. So the Duolingo program, uh, you can always assign, a make a classroom and be a classroom teacher on a Duolingo. Again, it's it's a practice for independent practice between classes. Um, and then there's a perk for teachers that if you have a classroom, right, you can um, get an account with all the um, different things uh, that you can study in other language too. So I use that um, to study other languages. And also you can see how many, how much time students spend working on, on sounds, on the words. Um, chat GPT, um, this is a new tool for me, but I'd like to explore it more too for students to actually practice online speaking part. Uh, right now we can use it for um, students practicing, um, looking at the rules too. But you can type in Russian, like create a dialogue of like 
uh, an introduction, like a person introducing itself, uh, herself, and then you can have a dialogue and you can actually have this uh, read to you for practicing. So you can have like a targeted prax practice for a different situation. Um, also, I know we cannot like rely heavily on that, but I think it's very kind of a, a tool that students can use um, if they need to, right? So they have to just learn how to use it appropriately. Even with um, advanced levels too, um, they can use it for proofreading their writing. Or um, in my advanced class, students were, their task was to, after study this um, uh, period of culture, uh, Russian culture from uh, ancient Rus to uh, perestroika, they had to compose the uh, monologue of one of the person from the one era. And they did it, they composed this, but they needed, of course, proofreading because it, it was hard, very hard to, you know, get it all right. And I couldn't, like I had 26 students, I couldn't be uh, in 26 different places to look at this. So I knew that they have their notes and they turn it in notes, but then they can use um, chat DPT to read it through and kind of polish and uh, correct the mistakes. Then they can actually see like, ah, I had to do it this way or this way. Um, also, you can listen to that and they can practice enunciation. So all of this uh, will be um, a technology tools. Of course, there's not only technology tools on, uh, on Zoom, right? We can have a lot of um, different things, even involving the rhythmic patterns for to learning how things work, um, stress patterns, um, one of the example to uh, like my daughter always wondered, what is the Kurich Karaba about? <laughs> this is one of the um, like a speckled hen. It's, it's a story that you know, the very first story that uh, read um, in a heritage homes to children. Um, basically, there's the plot is very easy. It's kind of a circle story. It like, goes around and around. And I said, oh, this is a wonderful story for actually to practice the patterns and the pronunciation. Jili, bili, dead da baba. And then bili, bili, right? So all these different kind of things and the pattern of how you say this is like another, like a poetry, but how you say it and then repeat it too. So it helps too um, if you meet online, even with the beginning students, you can practice these things. Um, one thing that we cannot do online all together in the class, we cannot sing together at the same time. Uh, <laughs> I complain, I say, oh, please do something about this. Maybe one day we can do that. Uh, right now we can do it only one at a time, but um, they can still practice even with a silencing um, and just say this loud, out loud. Um, I see the uh, you know, lips are moving in a correct way. That means they, <laughs> their pronunciation is correct. Um, and then kind of um, these activities, a lot of activities you can do um, in a, in a game-like tool. Um, uh, so I hope I, I have a lot of um, things under my sleeve, um, but I think that's the main thing is to have these uh, drills at home, use the technology uh, to practice, but also review this and always have these routines during the class. Uh, routines during the class so, and for students to understand that um, this is how we learn and that we need to learn that too. Um, and for heritage speakers, very important to again, know the purpose of that. Um, you know, a, a lot of them say, oh, I know how to speak Russian. Um, and then I'll show them this um, actual letter, you know, what is my proficiency kind of thing with the color coded, um, different things it says okay here's my proficiency level basic user parrot independent user survival um survivor and then reporter and kind of we're looking this okay what do i need to do to get from this level to this level how to level up this really helps uh for students to be serious about um speaking right we're not just looking for right answers it's not yes or no it's Yes, this is the part of the language and some of them are motivated because when I speak about the exam that's coming up, right, you need to speak. Uh, you need to actually show 
uh, what you can do with the language. So that's a great motivational tool um, for online classroom as well, when they can actually say where they are and what do they need to do to progress. Absolutely. And standards, levels of achievement can be a huge motivator, especially for students who come in and say, oh, I can speak Russian, but then how much can you speak Russian? How much can you use this in your day-to-day -day life? So excellent. Thank you for your thoughts on that, Larissa. And uh, let's go to Evgeny. Same question. How do you use technology or online resources to overcome challenges whenever you're fostering learner-to-learner -learner interaction, especially in that online environment? Sure. Thank you, Sarah. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank Sound you. Good. Okay, uh, excellent. So I think before before we start using technology, and I'm going back to my previous point that I made in the first session, uh, trying to actually avoid technology, uh, if possible, or overuse of technology, I think we should uh, ask ourselves, what are students looking for in education setting in general? What what do they come here for? Or what do they, What are, what is... What is missing in the online classroom that's present in the offline um and i think that's connection to human beings exchange of meanings um being personal uh you know personal interaction as I, th I think we should think about how we can it's impossible to do it certainly fully to the full extent but what can we how can we bring their individuality um, who they are uh, and help them e express it through online um, classroom. I think we should uh, encourage as much as possible, uh, uh, have ex encourage them not to blur the screen, for example, or use so everybody can see where they are if it's a Zoom classroom. So, I can see this cat walking through this computer. I could see your poster on the wall because I think this little things that makes us humans, not just little, you know, uh, pictures on, on Zoom makes uh, interaction interesting, help us uh, sort of a, Oh, um, Heather, I see you have, you know, flag of Texas on your wall. Are you, are you a real Texan or oh, what's the name of that cat? So this moments of spontaneous interaction that can occur and that can happen in real life. Oh, you know, wearing this pin, like what's that pin um, uh, for? So I think we should encourage that as much as possible and have students, I don't know, bring an object uh show an object kind of a show and tell kind of thing so they can show that thing that they 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 love they can show that uh thing that's standing uh, uh in in their room and and be in and in, in express their individuality and certainly use uh technology that's available uh to help that for example consider um doing a whatsapp group or setting up the whatsapp group so students have an outlet for um for exchanging meanings through that uh, it doesn't work with every classroom every group every age i i understand all the limitations and i would be the first to discourage us to impose social media the use of social media in the classroom so uh um, I have a lot to say about social media, but not today. But I think WhatsApp, creating an uh, online uh, community through WhatsApp, Telegram, or whatever, uh, that will allow students to, I don't know, exchange pictures, comment, you know, something that we do in real life um, that, again, helps kind of uh, enliven, enliven that interaction. I think that's, that's uh, helpful. And I, I had some fantastic... Uh, groups of students for whom that WhatsApp group became or group on the iPhone became sort of a, a, a very meaningful community, a very important one. So um, also uh, online tools, we need uh, online tools to structure the interactions to help students kind of a be, create that frame and for that, for example, I like using Google Docs and Google Slides. For example, if the, if it's if it's a group activity where students need to, I don't know, 
write a story or write several sentences or do something, come up with questions or, I don't know, do produce some 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 text um i would set up uh, a google uh, uh slide document and uh group breakout group one would go to slide one breakout group will two will go go to slide two and they will uh right and that in that way google slide will not move for example if you're using google docs um, um, uh, if somebody's typing on the top and somebody's st typing on the bottom, you know, start, things will st start moving, but Google Slide will help to avoid this problem. So that that creating that structure, even the, the format, the, the, the medium through which students will work together uh, to produce something will, will help them. Um, I also liked using Miro. Um, um, I can send the link later on my colleagues. I, I'm sure you use that 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 tool um, uh, at some point. It's an online board that again, it's 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 really a cool tool that helps you, for example, set up a gallery um, in in my uh, group projects that uh, we did quite a bit. Um, we you know did an online gallery. I would post post like say five pictures. Um, uh, five paintings by Russian painters, and the assignment was to kind of go through the gallery, um, pretend you're an actual gallery, kind of a um, mimic that conversation that's happening, comment on the picture, do you like it, do you dislike it, what do you particularly like about maybe read this uh, kind of a synopsis or a little description of the picture, and then uh, and then do something else. Um, so Miro helps organized or to organize the space helps to create the space and create the structure and then you can use um uh you can duplicate the boards and that, that that's 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 really helpful so uh again on the one hand it's whatever makes us human and that expressing emotions seeing individual selves um uh, whether it's through technology or through just using uh video and audio and or whatever visuals uh we have uh, we have and i certainly would encourage my students to to use the uh the camera and you know again not blur the screen and show us as much of your life as possible because that's really that's interesting that that create that sparkles the conversation so on the one hand there's that and you know and um our our um uh, drive to our desire to to connect with human beings being being with others uh being in a community and on the other, other hand it's the tools that helps us um um organize the uh assignments and create the structure and again they're very simple something we've been using quite a bit uh and that, that do not require training additional um introduction but they can be really effective there's a lot to be said for that human connection, and I completely agree. In fact, thinking back on my own language experience, I wonder if I would have continued down the path and going into those upper level courses if I didn't have the connections with my classmates and from friends that I made who spoke the target language. So there's a lot to be said for that for sure, but we can absolutely use technology to help facilitate those connections, and that's a great way to do it. Thank you, Evgeny. And then, uh, Heather, if you could please share your thoughts. How do you use technology or online resources to overcome the challenges whenever you're dealing with learner, learner interaction, especially in the online world? Okay, thank you. Um, Yevgeny, almost everything you said, I was just nodding um, because I, I feel exactly the same way. I kind of take a similar approach. Um, when I first started designing and building the online course, you know, my first thought was, okay, <laughs> first of all, like, I don't think I would have volunteered to design an online course way before, you know, everybody was, was, uh, familiar with it, but it was the job I was given. And so I thought, well, okay, what is the goal? You know, what are, what is the goal of, you know, first year Russian language instruction? And I started with that and thought, okay, how can I kind of, um, how can I make the technology uh, work for us to achieve the goals that we have for our classes? 
And um, rather than going out and, you know, finding lots of gadgets or apps, um, I thought, why don't we use what is most available, what we're most familiar with, and um, see if we can just uh, kind of exhaust the possibilities to to achieve our um, our end goals. And one of my favorite tools is really just going online. Um, we're online anyway. I tell the students we're already online. You have your browser open. Let's use some things. Let's let's find some things. One of our very first uh, tasks, and this is actually also on day one. Um, and this helps to promote community and to spark that conversation and, and get people talking and, and excited to get to know each other and to start learning is, um, and, and it also helps me get to know them, is I ask, okay, so what, what brings you here? That's, that's part of my first question. But also, um, I ask the students to think of something that they associate with Russian language or culture and go online and find a classroom appropriate image of, of that, that they are willing to share with everyone and say something about. So this is actually where online is actually a little bit better than face-to-face -face because this isn't something you can easily do in the face-to-face -face classroom without like prior planning for like a show and tell. But online, you know, students go and they, they find an image of, you know, Red Square or, or whatever it is. And we just share our screen, take turns sharing our screen in Zoom and talking a little bit about it. And of course, we all talk in English. And this invites the students to share what they're comfortable sharing, what's something that, you know, is exciting to them or interesting to them. And it gives us all a chance to start getting to know each other um, from, from day one. And so in, in really starting to build that community from day one is so important in the online classroom because it's so easy easy to otherwise just um, all fall apart in the ether and, and not really know what's going on or with each other. Um, another, uh, another tool I like to use is Google Slides. Um, Google Docs is great, but Google Slides, just like Yevgeny was saying, is really great um, because you can do exactly what he was saying send students to breakout rooms and assign them each a slide. So we'll all be in the same document and each breakout room can simultaneously see what the others are working on and work on their own. Um, one of my favorite kind of early activities, I think this is in unit two, um, maybe later, maybe unit four. Uh, I First, I, I create the slideshow and I find images online of empty apartment rooms. And um, I have, I don't, it depends on how many students, right? I find several images and put one empty room per slide. And then I uh, ask students before we get started with this to brainstorm lists of, of items that, you know, we need for our room. What, what are some common items we put into a bedroom or to a living room or to, you know, a kitchen? Um, and then students can find, either find images or I will provide images of, of these things and they can decorate their rooms with these images, you know, you can use um, images to just copy. What's wonderful about slides is that you can cut and paste images onto these blank rooms and you can decorate a room. So an activity after students are doing this is to come back to the main room or to get into slightly larger groups um, in individual breakout rooms and describe either their own room or somebody else's. So Google Slides is fantastic for these kinds of uh, activities. Um, I also, again, just being online, um, I do scavenger hunts with students and this takes no extra effort, no extra technology when we're, um, first learning numbers zero through 10. Um, I tell students, okay, go online, find the phone number for your favorite restaurant. And these are, can be students from, you know, all over the United States. They don't have to just be here in Austin. So they find the phone number and I, um, their task is to read the phone number in Russian and we all have to, you know, race and look up the phone number and be the first one to find the restaurant. 
I go first. I read the the number four Elizabeth Street Cafe, which is this great French Vietnamese place here in Austin. Um, and you know, students will they all want to know what this is. They'll they'll hear me read the number in Russian and look it up, and somebody will say, "Oh, I found it," and I'll share the site, and we can say a few words about what this restaurant is. Again, this is another kind of community building activity that does incorporate um, technology and incorporates actual Russian language. Um, and it's fun. And that is, um, like Evgeny was saying, it gets into our real lives and um, kind of it promotes conversation and, and as a result, community. So I guess that's pretty much it that I have to say. I, I try to stay simple. And I'm definitely hearing this common trend of, yes, there's a lot we can do with technology, but ultimately it's that community, it's that human connection that's really helping us to bridge those gaps and, and form connections between us as the educators, but also from student to student. So love that. Thank you. And Olga, again, same question. How do you use technology or online resources to overcome challenges whenever you're fostering learner-to-learner -learner interaction, especially online? Yeah, so and uh, I agree with the, the previous speakers that we do need to focus on the students' uh, learning and do not get distracted by tools and technology. But at the same time, I've noticed that uh, what makes it really uh, work in my classroom, whether this is a high school uh, student's classroom or whether it's a college uh, cl student classroom, is the interaction, right? It's the idea of uh, interactivity. It needs to be... Uh, that's why like, we use a lot of games, we use a lot of interactive activities, uh, we use uh, things that we, we, we engage their bodies, we engage in their space, whether it is uh, online or in person. And that's what I like how Evgeny mentioned about this, because both in our on online classes and in in face-to-face in -face classes, I would make students do something where they have like to react to things by, I don't know, clapping. It's like, there is something like, у кого есть два кота? If you have two cats, you need to clap, right? If you don't have clap, you like you need to just do something. And I do this also in order, like my one of my uh, issues, right? It's the students' uh, emotional state, right? That's why I was talking about how students can get uh, anxieties and they can be stressed out because of the difficulty of the language, because they're not progressing as fast as they hope they would, right? Because they have they compared to other languages they previously studied. So to create this uh, more, uh, to give them opportunities to uh, have a little bit of emotional, uh, I don't know, uh, rest, right? And mental rest, this is important. So that's what how I also would, in online classes, I would use the space. It's like, like Evgeny said, okay, so now go and find uh, one object uh, behind you or in your room and you need to tell us right for example it's this uh, this object needs to be related to the our current topic like hobby find something out you which is telling us about your hobby right and then they can show it do a show and tell and that's actually simple right you don't know the, you don't need to to use the technology for this as much however i do we do use um uh specific tools in our language online language classes so for example for our startup students but it's also because we could afford purchasing ipads for every single student in the classroom and this is like two classes of 10 students so we had 10 ipads so we were always using nearpod so this is our primary tool which we chose to use and it allowed uh, to have it interactive right we did all our, instead of slides, this was like our slides were through Nearport and they were not only projecting on the main screen in the classroom, but also on the, on the students' uh, iPads or if they're at home, they can also get and sign in into the, using the code and they can, uh, uh, they can interact with this through this app. And why it is great because, and it's probably attached more to, to the next question about feedback, right? It's that we uh, were able to assess our students' individual progress, right? They they have to respond to the specific activity and the, this app near pod, we will record each student's uh, response. 
and then the, the teacher can see what is going on and then can help those who fail this activity, right? Or who, who, uh, who, who took a much longer time to complete this activity. It also gives you the, an idea of what you need. It's like all formative assessments, right? Like need, it gives an idea to the teacher what to do next, how to support your students, how to help them. On. And um, uh, another, and this is for high school students, so we didn't use it for, for college students, but for um, my uh, regular college uh, classroom, what uh, Heather and uh, Evgeny uh, are using with uh, Google Slides, I use with uh, Miro, right, Miro board. And um, there are so many activities, and it's interesting that Heather mentioned about the empty room and how my students had to f furnish it. So here I just um, uh, copied a few examples of different activities uh, on this mirror board. So one of them, for example, empty rooms. And I also uh, added all these different pieces of furniture and lamps and uh, but paintings, and all this stuff. And students would have to drag and drop and furnish their room. And they're doing this as roommates. So it's always the, like all these activities have a task-based approach in mind. So there is a specific task. You're renting an apartment. You need, you have limited amount of money. You need to purchase furniture, maybe like used used one on like a, like Russian version of Craigslist, right? And now you like need to choose and drag and drop it and see what, so then you all agree, <laughs> despite all of you have different tastes. And, and then they talk, they, they have to communicate in, in Russian, and then they have to, to explain later on, they have to explain and kind of justify their choices to the entire group, report back. So there are some activities where they had to uh, build an itinerary. They were visiting Pittsburgh. So also I created a map of Pittsburgh. I uh, added uh, different images of different uh, places of interest in Pittsburgh and they had to create an itinerary for their friends who are visiting Pittsburgh, right? Also they're doing this in small groups and that's what like, interaction, I have a lot of small group activities where students have to be in like two, three. If it is online, they would do this in uh, Zoom rooms, right? And I'll just go uh, and like help them walking from one room to another. So there is um, another one when also I used uh, or several of these activities where I also in, in addition to using this interactive whiteboard, I would use authentic resources, so websites. So I would uh, include links. Uh, for example, one of them is the link to uh, Peking for the weather. We are traveling all over the uh, Russian Federation, for example, or to former uh, Soviet, uh, post-Soviet countries, right? Former Soviet countries. And then they have specific uh, specific uh, city. There is a link to the uh, uh, online website with the weather forecast, like geometry and stuff like this. They will have to go and check the weather, and then uh, put it, uh, write it in notes and on the board. What what is the weather? And then I also prepare uh, uh, images of uh, clothing, and they have empty suitcases, and they have like. To, to drag these items into the suitcase and also to to uh, to talk about this uh, and discuss and kind of getting ready for the trip to this specific town. And I think Miro is because it's one and students got used to this. So I, I was trying not to overwhelm them with like other technologies, but uh, the one which I used for a long time was Flip for video um, and speaking activities, right? And uh, this was integrated in our learning management system, system Canva, and the students had to not only post, it's always the task is you post your activity, but before you post something, you need to listen to the previous student uh, monologue and follow up, uh, find some, some something in common or something which differs, right? And then you need you might ask also a couple follow up questions after you're done with this part. Then you you uh, record your monologue. So that was how I was always uh, structuring these activities on Flip. And before Flip, unfortunately, Flip is no longer going to be available. Uh, before this, I used another one for many years. It was VoiceThread. So I might have to go back <laughs> and explore. <laughs> I haven't used it in like five years because I was using Flip instead, Flipgrid. So, but this is something also similar where you can leave 
uh, voice uh, response uh, questions and students will post questions, for example, and then other students will be responding to these questions which was posted by students. And that was uh, interpersonal communication in a way, right? <laughs> interpersonal speaking. Uh, and in a similar way, my students uh, have been using, and that's what Evgeny mentioned about uh, some kind of social media, right? My students, are use, we use Discord for the Russian program, and there are special channels there for level one in uh, novice students and for intermediate students. And that's when they also post something first about themselves in the beginning of the semester. Then they post specific essays or small posts. They have to respond. They have to ask questions. So it's a creating this uh, uh, social media post uh, model, right, of inter interpersonal writing, not, of course, in real uh, life, uh, right, uh, in real time, but uh, at least some somehow interactive. And uh, then I noticed the students, it's also is helpful for building the community. And that's what another thing, right? This challenging online. How do you create this community of students? So that um, I noticed the students start using it for something else. It's like, oh, they will post I need a partner. Мне нужен партнер для экзамена. Is there anyone who has, still hasn't? So it's kind of nice because it created this like semi-formal uh, channel for them to communicate if they need it. Or it's like, oh, I, I, uh, I cannot find my notes. Or where is the, where are the slides for this uh, lesson? Uh, has uh, uh, Olga Mikhailovna already posted them? <laughs> you know, so it's kind of nice. But I see, <laughs> I also saw this. So uh, it's uh, we had access to this. And I think finally, what I would mention, which I was, I use, I was, I start using, I was. Um, integrating social emotional uh, learning approach in the last uh, couple of years and last year was my focus in my uh, novice elementary russian and i've noticed that that helped a lot so i started creating uh, uh, different social emotional activities uh, including affirmations also for example positive habits and this is one of the activities uh, which i posted on miro because i started also using them online and especially for online students, start talk students. So they were meeting online through Zoom. We would post this uh, five, choose uh, five uh, habits which you're going to um, to follow for the next 20 weeks because we need to work, work on, on your physical and emotional well-being, right? And then they will choose and they would commit <laughs> and they would have to report back as like, where you were able to commit at least to one of them out of five <laughs> and for how many weeks and stuff like this. So uh, social emotional uh, learning approach uh, have been uh, like I've been using and you also in, in a regular in-person classroom. So, but this will be then handouts, for example, or sometimes I would have a screen and students will have to put like stickers on top. So again, again, to include this physicality, you know, the tactile aspect of learning. And I noticed that's what, started helps a lot but with online uh, classes i said they might not touch but they will do whiteboards or they will do i will I use the annotation uh in the zoom where they have to do something to put a star do check mark uh, write something and i think being engaged being interactive helps a lot and it helps also with the aspect of this like anxieties, high anxieties, fear to make mistakes because it becomes more um, interactive and more fun-like, less formal, even, even though we're still learning, right? But it, it does uh, help in my classroom. There is definitely that need to keep things formal, but also bring fun into it, especially in the online world, I find. So lots of great ideas. Thank you so much for sharing those, Olga. Uh, you touched a little bit upon feedback, and that's actually our next question to ask for the panel. And if, Olga, you'd like to start with that one, that'd be great. And the question is, how do you provide feedback that's necessary to learn while encouraging students to partake in those learner interactions in the online environment? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so with the... Uh... My students who are like a regular college students, we do have learning management system. And of course it's it's helpful, it's useful because then we use the learning management system to leave comments. And we do leave comments both uh, typed, but also audio comments because uh, Canva, uh, Canvas, for example, allows you to leave recordings. And I've noticed that sometimes this is uh, uh, this is more important, especially if this is a speaking activity that they were submitting online, if it was a, a some asynchronous task. 
And uh, that's what I, I found very helpful to leave comments there, individual comments, and both uh, typed and sometimes uh, written, especially if it's handwritten activity, I would use and correct it in the canvas, which canvas uh, allows you to do this. Uh, and uh, audio or video uh, responses. So when uh, we did the same thing with Flip, when students were posting uh, their videos, we would leave the feedback both typed and audio video, especially if there was a focus. If I knew that some of the students maybe needed less uh, help with the pronunciation, intonations, right? Then we would just have like, written typed comments. But if you notice the students are still struggling with this, like for phonetics and, you know, stress patterns, oh, uh, we would be leaving uh, audio comments. And we have, uh, at Pitt, we have also undergraduate teaching assistants. So they helped us with this task as well. Um, and uh, uh, as I said, uh, uh, with the Discord, for example, when my students were posting stuff, uh, instead of correcting their mistakes there, I would uh, I would uh, try to follow up on their comments or on their posts. But then this time I would use like I would choose only a couple of the like targeted mistakes, right? And I would comment, but I would rephrase and incorporate the correct form in my response or in my follow-up question so for them to encounter but when we have during consultations time like uh, individual consultations I would look and I will show them and say okay here's the correct form this is what you used so we'll um, reflect on this uh, as well and um, uh, also what I noticed what was extremely uh, helpful like I mean I mentioned Nearport right Nearport because it provides also individual uh, feedback and that's what I noticed uh, that was extremely helpful because we could see where the students are heading to and who needs support who needs more support who needs uh, less support but um, uh, things like for example even uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, pairing up students uh, and asking for peer feedback, like peer reviews, that was extremely helpful. And I know that it, uh, like we have usual mixed groups, but also at the like already maybe intermediate level and higher, our uh, proficiency levels begin to, to range, <laughs> right? And uh, sometimes for things like this, I might use some of my strongest students, some of my heritage speakers, to provide some feedback for those students who need um, uh, support. So it not comes only from the teacher, but it can, can come in like more informal, informal way. And I can do this in a small groups, right? When they do some kind of working on specific task, working on a specific project, and then this uh, one or two students will be helping the other student. So this is just a couple ideas how I've been using feedback and providing feedback both in like a virtual environment and face-to-face -face environment. Excellent. And both are helpful, especially like working peer reviews in where you can and having a little bit of feedback going both ways. I think that's really important. Thank you for that. And let's go to uh, Larissa, if you don't mind chiming in. How do you provide feedback that's necessary to learn while still encouraging students to partake in those learner interactions, especially in the online environments? Um, as I already mentioned before, um, I often use, you know, for the formal, for the formal feedback um, and informal too, for conversational practice to set up uh, the task to this um, actual, um, what is my proficiency? Uh, what is my proficiency? Um, the letter. So uh, it helps students to know what is expected from them when they're actually uh, speaking. Um, but um, also there's so many other things we do. Even in a Google Classroom, I use Google Classroom. There is one very simple function there. Uh, so, uh, I post a question or I post a, a picture and the students uh, will um, have a like a answer to the question. How was your weekend? My weekend was great. Um, and provide like a three things that you have to, uh, what did you do during the weekend? And so on. Sometimes I open it for the comments from the peers too, and the peers can uh, have a comments to comments. Uh, sometimes it's just the comments from the teacher. I like to use a peer review too. So if there is a, 
uh, possibility depending on the uh, maturity level of students and their proficiency level too. Um, it's very powerful to receive the feedback from peers first. Um, some classroom activities that we have, of course, there's a lot of uh, community building activities. And of course, the language is a social thing. So this is very important for us to be a community. Um, very often, or like one of the ice breaking activity in the beginning activity of the union, uh, students have to uh, present the 10 things about me, like Google Slides. Uh, we, again, it could be different proficiency, it could be just pictures in one word, or can it be uh, like a picture and, you know, sentences and paragraphs with each of the slides. But after the presentation, everybody who was, listen, uh, who was listening need to uh, ask a question, provide feedback and ask a question. Um, of course, there is a mini lesson how to provide feedback. <laughs> what can you say? What, like a sentence stems, you know? Um, how would you express that you like something? And, or how would you have like a, a positive criticism? How would you phrase it in Russian language? Uh, it's both creating a community, um, opening up like a norms and safe space, and also learning the language needed for that. Um, even some po polite way to say that you don't understand something, like or how to say, so there's some things like that. It's part of the feedback too, but it's how to provide it in a polite and appropriate way. Um, and then each student after the presentation will have to provide a feedback. It could be in the formative or in a Google Slides or in a Google Classroom, um, in some anonymous or not anonymous. It depends on the situation. Um, but I will like, cannot ask like the whole class if it's 26 students in the class, but I can ask some of them to, to actually um, say it out loud. So kind of learning accountability and um, everybody knows that they could be asked. So random asking uh, questions too, um, which is important too for students to um, have this equality in a conversation. Um, actually the uh, modeling, yeah, it's very important too, again. And then uh, setting up the task. Um, if there are so many mistakes, I cannot provide it. Like I cannot correct all mistakes. We are like learning this form today. And this is what I'm providing a feedback on. I'm not correcting all the mistakes are there, um, but this is what we do. Um, when students have their own discussions in rooms, in the Zoom function rooms, um, I will visit them and make some notes. And at the end, of the activity will come together and I will, uh, not mentioning the names, but um, I can say for the whole class, like what, um, you know, we work today and what um, I see that what we need to work on. And then I will send uh, like a targeted feedback to students who need to work on something independently um, or some private comments. So, and also kind of knowing the community, knowing who will be okay if I will, you know, correct them uh, publicly or who not. So kind of have this sensitivity um, about that. Um, also, of course, I um, remind about the norms too. The norms is very important and feedback like today, we're working on that task. Um, or some of the uh, very often uh, strategies that I use is when we one student is interviewing another one and then um, and they switch the roles and then the other uh, person is talking about not themselves but about like using a third person uh, <laughs> narrative about another person so kind of a round robin too it could be partners and could be in the groups too in the groups the whole group have to come up with the um, things that have they have in common. So that could be icebreaker at the beginning of the uh, unit or year. Um, like they have to find three things that everybody, maybe five people, maybe even more, or maybe just three have in common and also some unique characteristics. And then um, after they, you know, create this little presentation about their group, then I would say, okay, you found, yeah, you found this. So like feedback will be, okay, you um, did the task that was assigned to you or help them uh, with coming up with something else. Again, it's very important to first set up what they're working on and then provide feedback on that too. Um, and I guess this one too, um, students need to know what they need to do to level up. 
So in a feedback, very often, even if everything is great, then for the whole group, the feedback is, okay, now we're going to, next time we're going to work on that. So this is our next step. I think that's the main points that I have for the necessary feedback. Um, Those are all really important points. And I really like how you establish the norms about if we're doing peer feedback, what are we looking to help our fellow classmates with and making sure that we don't go into overwhelm. My story, I'll just quickly share. It was one of my uh, upper level university classes that I had to write a composition in the target language. And I remember getting my results back. I must not have understood the lesson very well because I remember the paper just being full of red ink and it was quite overwhelming. So we definitely want to make sure we kind of pick and choose what exactly are we trying trying to help our students with and making sure that we're giving them the feedback they need, but not too much. That's kind of overwhelm. Thank you for that, Larissa. We appreciate it. And Evgeny, we'll go to you again. The same question, how do you provide feedback that's necessary to learn while still encouraging students to participate in those learner interactions, especially in the online world? Sure. Um, and I actually find myself giving, providing uh, more detailed feedback, especially for the written homework and my students even um, at the very early stages of their proficiency, um, I asked them to do homework on online through Google Doc. And I ended up creating this little library of comments that I, uh, you know, save in my, you know, whatever note taking app. And if somebody's making, usually, you know, often, students make the same mistakes so okay i have a comment about oh, i have a comment about the case i have a comment about Katori clauses and i and this comment uh, this comments end up to be you know because i have space and it's certainly i can it's easier to insert those comments into google docs so this is not just correcting students but explaining uh, the mistake, explaining what's going on, why accusative case is appropriate, appropriate here. So actually provides me more, more space and makes it easier for me to um, be detailed in my feedback for the written homework. And as far the, as far as the kind of a um, synchronous communication, I find zoom and you know platforms like this are very helpful and it's something I, I, i'm trying to do sometimes in my actual classroom physical classroom um either myself or someone else will be sort of the alter ego of the person so the, this invisible helper that can be behind the person and whispering um the right answers or helping if somebody somebody's stuck and that's I'm trying to replicate it through chat. And if somebody is, you know, providing an answer and uh, saying something, I could uh, write in the chat um, to that person specifically, helping them with the vocabulary, helping them with the, uh, with this, with grammar or um, uh, asking a question that, uh, additional question they they could answer if they stuck and they don't know what to say so that kind of a that help that assistant invisible assistant is actually um you know uh is is really easy to do also when my students um uh do an exam and they usually do it in the format of uh a pair talking you know two students talking to each other um, I, uh, I'm there, I turn off my camera, I turn off my sound, so I'm there, but I'm not there, so they, they don't see me, they're talking to each other, I am there to kind of, uh, record, you know, uh, they, they speech and kind of make, make my comments, which I sometimes do in real time through chat, uh, but I'm also, that kind of uh, removes the stress from like, oh, uh, the teacher watches me during the test or during the exam. And, you know, it's sort of a, oftentimes students forget that you're here because they don't see you. Um, but uh, it could also be um, uh, a device to help a, a struggling student who, you know, forgetting. Again, you can 
um, sort of a channel your your help or your additional questions to the students through a private chat, uh, uh, or it can be sort of um, this uh, invisible someone who will later provide the 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 feedback uh, to students after they're done. And as far as uh, we mentioned the work in Google Doc and the Google Slides, um, since you're there and you can see what students are doing, uh, you can use a highlighting tool to sort of uh, highlight things that need um, need more work. And maybe you can devise a system of, of colors. If it's yellow, then it's, you know, vocabulary the students need to work. And if it's green, then it's, it's grammar. Uh, but instead of uh, sort of uh, correcting them right away or um or of giving them the right answer you could just highlighting could be the first you know step i use technology in that way uh and then they would they would correct or you could also use the comment section comment function to to provide a more detailed feedback to students who are working on on something on a text or um, something else. And we talked about formative, we talked about other tools. I also want to remind you about the polls. You know, a simple uh, thing like a, a Zoom poll could be uh, um, a quick way to get, uh, to to provide feedback and, and to get fed feedback also. But, you know, if there's a, if there's a concept you're explaining or uh, you need to do a quick uh, vocab quiz or whatever so the 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 zoom polls are so easy to set up and administer uh you don't need to go out of the zoom or use any external application so that's a tool that's right there at your disposal and can be used for for feedback um i think that's all i wanted to say Excellent and well put. As far as the comments as well that we can put in, I, I primarily teach in Canvas and I love that we have a feature where we can put a comment in for a student and also take them right out to some other type of online resource. I have a plethora of things and uh, comments that I've just accumulated over the years of students making the same mistakes, but I love that I can put in some extra supplemental feedback or some supplemental resource that's going to make more sense that they'll be able to make the connection hopefully have an easier time with that. Thank you for that, Evgeny. And then Heather, same question, again, talking about feedback. How do you provide feedback that's necessary to learn while encouraging students to still partake in those learner interactions in the online environment? I actually um, don't know that I have a lot to add to what my colleague said. I do pretty much all of, all of these same things. Um, like I said, we use Canvas. And um, just like you, Sarah and Olga, um, I really love this feature in Canvas that I can provide this, um, you know, personalized feedback. Either I can leave a video <laughs> if I find that to be more helpful. I can just leave audio, which I do most of the time because um, it's usually late at home when I'm grading. Um, and then for written, yeah, I do a lot with uh, Google, with Google Docs, you know, using the suggesting uh, function and leaving comments or highlighting where necessary. Um, if it's during a, um, a synchronous meeting, it really depends, right? Um, I think most, most of us language ed educators, like we try to parcel out um, our corrections. And um, I probably like a lot of you, I don't, I don't like to correct every single mistake that a student is making in real time. Um, so it really just depends, you know, if, uh, if the mistake is small and it's not something that we're focusing on, then, then I'll just let it slide. If it is, um, something that we're learning, like maybe accusative case, you know, I might, uh, when a student is done, you know, stop and say, well, I heard this or, or uh, follow up and write it in the chat or do both, you know, say and write in the chat. Um, this is what I heard. Um, you know, I, is there anything that is wrong here, you know, or, or that we could correct? Um, and, but it really just depends on, on what the mistake is and whether or not it's uh, kind of a topic of, of what we're working on. Um, if, if it's a mistake that students 
all are making, I may just, you know, stop a student where they are and say, okay, <laughs> let's stop. One, one thing I can think of is what I, what I ask at the beginning of every, you know, class is Kagdila. Um, and invariably like several students will say, ya harasho, ya harasho. and this is, can't say that <laughs> you, you can't do that. And, um, and so I, I will, usually stop in this this is the first few classes of every semester stop and say okay what's going on here we can't you know I'll, I'll go over the rules and stuff so it really just really just depends um when it's the synchronous meetings like whether it's an important topic or not whether it's something that's systematic and all students need to focus on um and then if it's offline asynchronous i really try to kind of exploit and take advantage of all of the Canvas tools that that we have for leaving feedback, and that's it. Excellent. And like you, it definitely depends on kind of what we're doing, and I, I would not always necessarily jump on every error. Sometimes I like to just get them producing, get them talking in the target language, and, and get them going in the right direction. Thank you for that. So for the next few questions, I'm hoping we can go a little bit more rapid fire since we have a lot of content still to cover. Um, but I want to make sure that we get to some of these topics that are quite important. And our next question is talking about uh, what makes it a little bit challenging uh, using the Russian language. So what can make it challenging or maybe unique, maybe unique might be a better word, to Russian that makes giving feedback a little bit more challenging? So what are the things maybe about the Russian language in general that can make giving feedback more challenging to your students? And how do you address this? Uh, Heather, would you like to chime in first, please? Uh, yeah, sure. Um... I would say that it's um, how different Russian is, the, the different grammatical structures um, in Russian uh, versus English. One of the first things that my students learn how to say, and I'm sure everybody's students learn how to say here, is my name is, which is Minyazavu. It's a completely different grammatical structure, but students tend to interpret this phrase as a word for word translation from English into Russian. So this Minya means me, it's this accusative case form of me, and zavut is a verb form that means they call. So its word order is different. The words themselves are, are completely different, but at first students just, it, and like they would, you know, naturally do translate from English, they align this word minya with my, and zavut must mean name. And so it's that the structure of Russian is just so incredibly different um, how do you even convey from the very beginning this concept of case and word order when they're learning a, a foreign language perhaps for the first time? If you're a native English speaker, even conceiving of this idea is so foreign and so hard. And so I think I feel like it's that. It's it's that that this this vast difference in in the the language the way they're structured um talking about that itself i think makes giving the correction um or, or giving feedback challenging um because like students mean what do you what do you mean <laughs> what do you mean that's not just my name is um if that if that makes sense i'm sure my colleagues have have plenty to say about this that makes perfect sense whenever there's so much difference and students want to intuitively jump in, but they maybe shouldn't make those connections just yet. That can definitely make things challenging. Really good. Thank you. Uh, Olga, if you'd like to chime in next, what kinds of things do you think are unique to Russian that make giving feedback more challenging to students and how do you address that? I personally, I'm not sure if I even agree with this, <laughs> with this phrase and that unique to Russian, because I think teaching any, any world language, right, uh, especially if it is a less commonly taught language, not necessarily Russian, can be challenging for English speakers, right? So I personally, I cannot think of anything specific about Russian in comparison to any other less commonly taught languages and uh, those languages that use a different uh, alphabet you know different uh, uh, letters so but I think what what I notice and what helps when let's say Russian grammar definitely is different from English grammar 
So I think what helps me in my classroom, and it's not necessarily an online classroom, right? this is in general, my, my Russian language classroom, is that trying to bring more parallels and trying to bring more associations and connections, first of all, to other languages that they studied or to other languages that they knew, because we also have... Um, very often in my at Pete, we get uh, students of other Slavic languages that take in Russian. So we have Ukrainians, we have uh, Polish students from heritage, uh, uh, Slovak heritage, or Croatian heritage. So I try when, of course, when I learn about the students in the beginning about their background, and I try to find out like what other languages they studied before. This helps me because I can bring parallels. So. And I bring, I can bring, because I also studied German at some point and French. So I can, when I'm explaining something, conjugations, uh, case system, I can refer them to those languages. But even sometimes drawing parallel in, if some of them don't have, uh, I don't know, really solid uh, knowledge or uh, skills and uh, any solid skills in other uh, languages besides English, Sometimes I even try to bring parallels uh, to English and even explaining things like, oh, they're like, why is so different? Like case system is so different. And it's like, why do you have? And I said, well, but just think about this. Well, you don't say um, uh, who you you got this uh, present, right? It's like who you got this present. It's like, what's the statement? You say from whom you've got this present. And this is your who versus whom. And this is your to whom, from whom, even small, you know, drawing parallels to things like that they already familiar, that maybe they just never focus because it's in their native language. It also helps with heritage speakers, right? Using like integrating meta, -lingu uh, meta language and trying to kind of bring whatever they already have, <laughs> any luggage that came to my classroom and just find out about it, what they have and what I can use in order to to make uh, studying Russian easier and more comprehensive uh, more comprehensible and uh, more digestible <laughs> so that's that's my couple words on this topic excellent and I'm sure that you and I have a lot of the same struggles although I teach Japanese you teach Russian I'm sure we have a lot of the same struggles because the languages are structured so different from English and sometimes students don't always get that the first time so Excellent. Thank you for sharing. Uh, let's go to Evgeny again. Same question. Uh, what do you think are some of the things that might be a little bit more unique to Russian that give giving feedback um, makes it a little bit more challenging for your students? And how do you address that? Sure. Uh, a quick answer. I think, you know, the fact that Russian has endings and and that coupled with imperfect technology and the fact that I cannot always hear well what my students are saying, and sometimes they're saying things correctly, but I'm mishearing them and not hearing, you know, uh, exactly what they're saying through Zoom, uh, whether it's because their connection is bad or my connection is bad. I think that's that's a challenge because, you know, are we sure we, you know, we're <laughs> correcting what needs to be corrected or it's just uh, the audio problem. I think that's, that's, that's the challenge. And, you know, going back to phonetics, I think because, because Russian has different uh, sounds, uh, sound system, and there are a lot of words, a lot of sounds that are unique to Russian uh, and intonation patterns that, that needs to be uh, uh, addressed. Uh, so that that's, and to, uh, Again, like we were saying, technology is not perfect this day. So uh, working on that is is a challenge. Giving feedback and correcting the sounds um, makes it difficult to do online. That can definitely be challenging, especially whenever there are audio glitches. That can definitely be hard for any language. Definitely, I agree. And then Larissa, same question. Uh, what kinds of things are maybe a little bit more unique to Russian that can make giving feedback challenging? And how do you overcome that? Yes, and here too, I will say there's a two like major um, challenges. Is one is uh, like everybody said, and Heather and Olga and Evgeny. Uh, yes, it's a very different grammar, um, and it's hard sometimes to explain. Some students really want to have a translation, like tell me how it's in English, and there's not everything you can actually tell how it is in English. It's just not possible to translate. 
So you just have to kind of explain with words, but there is no equivalent of, you know, the difference of some things, um, especially even for the advanced speakers is like a perfect and imperfect aspect of uh, the Russian verbs. Um, it's very difficult. I've heard so many like, uh, uh, we pashli, uh, we pashli yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so all of this, of course, interference with the English here and all this, you know, go, the verb go everywhere, but uh, all the verb do is everywhere, but it's not, um, you have to choose a different one. And it's very hard to explain, uh, even on a like very advanced levels to practice and practice and practice. And so there are some rules sometimes, but there's so many exceptions to um, that I'm saying, yeah, okay, here's yeah the genitive plural, here's a rule. But, but <laughs> um, not even native speakers sometimes use it correctly. So we have to be, um, yeah, careful with, with that. Um, another thing is that uh, unique to the heritage speakers, I think, is they come from different families and they learn Russian. The first Russian was from their families and the community groups. Um, May, very often their parents themselves emigrated to the United States as, in, as children. So they were not educated in America, uh, I mean, in Russia, I'm sorry. And um, their language is kind of a mix of everything, of different dialects. So uh, the most common is um, English and Russian and Ukrainian, because in a community, these languages are kind of intermixed. Uh, and then uh, in the community, everybody's speaking this kind of a pidgin variation. Uh, and understand each other. Uh, and when they come to the classroom and I have to provide them feedback that this is not the right form, you can't say that this is not correct. So I think this is very emotional and I learned that they have to be very, very careful how you provide the feedback. Um, I have this, um, as a linguist, of course, I believe that all the different forms of languages are valid. Uh, if we can communicate, you know, there's a group of people understanding every each other. So this this is a good uh, good example of uh, this dialect, and you know, translanguaging it's a beautiful form of kind of a stepping stone to uh, toward bilingualism, um, and it's accepted. Uh, you know, it's not I don't have to be very strict about this. It's like a stepping stone. But I think it's essential for us to teach students a standardized form of a language so they can communicate um, effectively outside of their small community groups and use language professionally. Um, and they can succeed on a standardized exam. So otherwise, if they'll provide the form that they speak, they will not be able to get any, um, any credits for that, uh, that dialect. So I use this analogies, analogies, um, to sports or music. I would say, for instance, there is a different, we can, okay, you can say I can swim, right? I can swim in a, um, in a lake with my friends and it, it's fun. But if I'm going to Olympics, that will be not enough, <laughs> right? I have to follow the rules and I have to be really precise rules or otherwise I'm disqualified from the, from the Olympics. Uh, always a music too. A lot of people can, you know, play piano, guitar casually at the gathering. Um, we have fun. We play. It's um, it's great. But then, if we enter some kind of the um, competition or if we go to concert, right, we judged on how well you can use the rules. So I found this analogy works um, when we speak about the standard the Russian and the one is a mix with the different dialects. Um, so like first, again, setting up the uh, norms and when I provide the feedback and why I do that. It's not because, you know, my language is better than yours um, or I'm not as st stuck up the, um, you know, academic lady. It's just because I care about you and we want to know the standard form. It's acceptable to talk at home. Um, and it's great with your with your dialect, uh, using your dialect. But you know, if you go to an academic setting, you have to use another um, another language, another uh, forms of it. Um, so I think this is important to yeah take this in consideration, and when providing a feedback, to know that um, it could be very personal. You know, if a community member speaks this dialect. 
That is a really good point that he said. And I love the analogies you're giving about swimming in the lake versus the Olympics or playing guitar at home versus say going to piano recital. It's a really good analogy. And it shows that you're acknowledging the skills that your students have, but at the same time, I care about you. I want you to advance the level of proficiency. And if you needed to use the say an academic or business setting, you would know how to proceed. Beautiful analogy. Thank you so much for sharing that. And going on to the next question, um, this is dealing more with culture and it is how can online Russian educators use culture to build the classroom community and foster a fun and positive online environment? Uh, Larissa, if you'd like to start, please. Of course, it's very important. Yes, the, nothing can be done if there is a mistrust between students too in the classroom. Um, so of course we have to spend um, time at the beginning to get to know each individual student. Um, and with the programs that I taught, um, usually there is a survey sent um, to find out you know, some things when students answer questions um, and even interview like a short interview um, talking about interest and hobbies. But this is for me to know uh, the students, but also for everybody to know each other. It's important, right, to um, get to know your classmates as well. Not just the teacher knows students, but the students have to uh, know each other. Um, and so beginning, of course, uh, finding uh, what is common, I like this uh, Venn diagram. It could be uh, done in, in rooms when students are kind of making a double bubble. What's what we have in common? Uh, what's our uniqueness? And they have they involved in conversation and then uh, coming up with a, like a graphic organizers for groups or even maybe giving a name of a group or something that they have to agree upon. Um, and also when we go to different topics and well, right, last two years, it's been difficult in a Russian language classroom. Um, so we have to make sure we talk about the very uh, hot topics, I would say, um, not um, involved in a personality, right? So we talk about something, but not about personal things. It's it helpful for me to use analogies in a history, too. Um, when we talk about culture, right? We start with the ancient, ancient Rus, or we talk about perestroika. This is my um, favorite topic and we find a lot of parallels that we can actually discuss past and discussing uh, the uh, present at the same time, but kind of having a little bit of distance um, because families and, you know, students might have a very different opinions and it's not something that we can solve and right in class, we don't want, um, you know, to to have this political debates in class. So it's not um, what our purpose is. However, we want to um, have this class culture and, and learning how to accept a different perspectives. Again, analogies of a sport um, or, or music, a sports usually good or music, like a different taste in music. And we have a debate. So, okay, well, you know, who is the better? Uh, what musical style is the better hip hop or like country music? It could be different things. It's not, it could be personal too for some students, but not um, as uh, painful if it's a connecting to some uh, groups that they um, belong to or something like a family, something from a family coming to the classroom. Um, or sports, right? What is the best sport? Could be heated debate. That's what we want. We want some provoking, some uh, some feelings about it. But we don't want to, you know, step on something that we can't deal in the classroom. Yeah, um, like sport. What is American football? How, what What do you think is American? <laughs> so, and you can see the different opinions, right, um, about that. Um, also, it's important that no matter uh, what, but all different levels, all different backgrounds, everybody has to have the voice. Um, again, setting up the norms of a communication. And for the teacher, even uh, when I'm online, I have all these different, sometimes I don't see all the uh, you know screens because there are too many. Then I have to have like my own uh, row here. And I say, okay, I ask the students, I ask the students. So I need to like, ask him or her. So kind of making sure that I everybody has voice 
and you know have the same level of participation. Nobody is forgotten there. Um, so it's important too. And when I know what students like, I have to make sure I put it in the in a language learning too. So if everybody um, likes uh, soccer, then we, of course we're going to speak about that. So something that they're interested in. Maybe I put uh, somebody who's expert in this to talk about this and have a presentation or a lot of chess players. Okay, the chess players can have a presentation about, you know, uh, Karpov or Kasparov. So somebody like a famous um, uh, Russian chess player. Um, in a summer camp that I had this uh, summer, I had uh, a student who was really into these old uh, instruments. Um, and she was very, very quiet. She didn't want to like participate in any discussions. But then when there was a topic of a musical instruments, she actually prepared beautiful presentations. She brought uh, the old uh, violin, I forgot the, the name of this instrument, it was like 200 years old, to show and tell about this. And she's just blossomed and then her lang language just really, um, she prepared a presentation about what she really likes. And then she had this different, so everybody after this view her different issues. So she's not like not talking at all, uh, but she actually could talk and speak about the subject that she really likes. So I think our, a role as educator is to find the sparkles for everyone who can actually come up out of their bubbles and speak about this and bring this culture of uh, all the voices are heard um, in a language classroom. I think we're powerful uh, <laughs> mediators to do that. And then um, we'll all learn something from each other. Hello, Lisa. That's such a cool success story. That totally made my day hearing about the student that's quiet and shy and then finding that spark, something she loves, and then she wants to share that with the other students. That just totally warms my heart and makes my day. Thank you so much for sharing that. And again, same question, this one dealing um, with culture. And the question again was, how can online Russian educators use culture to build the classroom community and foster a fun and positive online learning environment. Evgeny, if you'd like to chime in, please. Yes, thank you. And thank you, Larissa. I think Spark is good and actually would like to have a political debate in my classroom. And if the students are ready for it, if there is enough kind of a, a collegial atmosphere and friendly, why not? Why not talk about politics in a, in a friendly um, kind of a calm way this is something we we need to um go back to because i think at some point we could and uh uh and if it also of course it depends on age and the question uh, that you pose it but i think we should definitely try a little bit uh and um have tr tr try um introduce debatable topics in, to our students and for me online uh, teaching became uh, a actual good window to to the world and the, the world of russian speakers real people that i can bring to my classroom through zoom and i, I know a lot of my colleagues uh, are still inviting their friends their colleagues they i don't know um uh, more or less famous people, um, directors, musicians, just uh, uh, anyone who, for whom Russian is a, a native language or maybe they achieved a high level of proficiency. And I think that's, um, for many students, they would be the, they would be the first person besides you, if you're a native speaker, a real Russian speaker they would speak to, and that would be so meaningful and so interesting. And again, we can use Zoom tools such as chat. Uh, if if my my guest speaker is giving a little talk or or talking to students, I, I serve as a kind of a, a life um, a caption device and uh, provide uh, um, um, glossing and words that student may students may not know uh, in the chat, so um, everybody can kind of uh, keep up with what people are saying. I think that's that is really uh, really meaningful. Something we should be using a 
more in our regular classroom and on online certainly provides opportunity for like maybe kind of a mini group conversations uh with with someone or or a large group conversation um and i want to address actually address um uh forgot whose question was uh Dar daria uh no julia's question about um uh Ukraine and uh, the war was uh, the war was Ukraine because I think that that kind of go, brings us back to culture and what we what we teach and what we um, uh, avoid doing. I think in my classroom, Julia answering your question directly, I kind of certainly do do less that pertains to the government of of Russia. Um, uh, and the, this kind of uh, if we could make fun of Putin riding a horse or some something that was kind of mildly amusing to us, this this is out of my classroom now. Um, but I'm also kind of uh, thinking about okay, so I need to be teaching about Russia and maybe have more responsibility to teach about why why this is happening and the the causes and what what happened in the you know multi-century history of russia before that you know has has consequences now so that's why for example i started teaching a history of ussr or cultural history of ussr trying to explain uh the, the the mentality of Russian people, the mentality of the Russian government figures, and how it led to uh, 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 the war today. So that kind of a uh, um, bringing more uh, nuanced understanding to my students, so they know the context and they know why why this is happening uh that what changed in my classroom i'm not sure how it, it's hel it's helping me build the community but certainly uh i think we have a responsibility to kind of uh to be to mark our position an anti-war position and i'm sure all of us here in this room share this and um kind of uh support our students who might feel you know vulnerable um, you know, Larissa, you talk about uh, a lot about uh, you talk a lot about Harris students, and some of them are th they do come from you know Ukrainian families and have some uh, uh, family in Ukraine. I think that that conversation where students kind of uh, know your position, they you know where you stand, you know where you're coming from. Um, that makes it makes it makes it uh, makes it makes a difference for them, and they would feel safer and kind of uh, um, more protected uh, in a way in in your classroom. Thank you, Evgeny. And you mentioned uh, bringing in a historical perspective, and I think for a lot of students, especially non-native speakers. Um, they're non-heritage speakers that don't have that background. Sometimes that can be important to take on um, some different perspectives and take a look at some historical things too. So thank you for that. Uh, we are very quickly wrapping up, um, but just to get to all of the panelists quickly, um, Olga, if you'd like to chime in, how can online Russian educators use culture to build the classroom community and foster that fun and positive, positive environment online? Thank you. And uh, Evgeny has already mentioned this it's the use of the community global community local community uh, native speakers of russian and uh, the the carriers of uh, cultures uh, uh, from the countries in, uh, where russian is used uh, uh, reg on a regular basis so uh, definitely in our in our classroom we use the native speakers we zoom them in also for example uh, we created activities on flip where I asked, uh, I use social media, my Facebook page. I recruited native speakers, my friends, friends of my friends, and they recorded, and they were from all, all different parts of Russian Federation, right, from different regions, also from different post-Soviet countries, from Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Belarus, uh, 
Ukraine, uh, Kazakhstan, like you name it, right? Latvia. And these native speakers, like I provided with a special prompt and they recorded videos about their country. They had also to do like show and tell, introduce a small, like the, show an object that symbolizes their cult, uh, country, I explain uh, what it means, like to talk about the food and uh, talk about a little bit about geography but I also guided them what exactly I needed and because it was for novice students I also asked like I, I had to 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 kind of provide them with, uh, with instructions on how not to complicate the language and uh, our students had to go we posted them on flip and then our students had to interact with them they had to go and find all these different countries uh, listen to a few of them then respond reply to them uh, ask the questions and uh, that was uh, i noticed that this was a very uh, um, uh, effective uh, activity because later on students became uh, interested in specific part of the of uh, of Russia or in a specific part of the post-Soviet space because of the speakers. So, for example, uh, in we use uh, cultural projects as well. So it's almost like P PBL, some elements of PBL. Uh, we do a couple of uh, couple projects uh, throughout the semester, and students work in groups. And there is a specific a specific uh, task that they have to to explore, and I let them choose the region. Right, it's like Russian-speaking uh, region, whether it's post-Soviet uh, post culture, post-Soviet country, whether it's part of some uh, parts of Russia, maybe uh, I don't know, maybe Karelia, uh, maybe somewhere part of Siberia uh, or Dagestan, and then they explore and they explore, they explore hobbies, they explore the national cuisine, uh, they explore the uh, like national, uh, for example, clothing and like how people look, their appearances, and they created uh, infographics, they created digital children's books, online books for this as, as part of these projects, they created cultural brochures, and they also created like YouTube videos, like travel logs and stuff like this. So uh, different formats for different uh, throughout the year and uh, that's definitely helped us uh, a lot to get to know more about Russian speaking cultures especially cultures outside Moscow cultures outside St. Petersburg and it was student driven because students could focus on the part that they're interested to so they could explore hobby for example something they, they like uh, active hobbies because they are maybe hockey players here in, in Pittsburgh so then they will explore some kind of sport and hobby popular in Kyrgyzstan, right? So again, it was dictated by their own, their own interests. And I found this connection to their own culture, to their personal background was extremely helpful to learn about other cultures. Oh, that's so cool. I love hearing about when students are able to kind of own what they want to learn about and explore their own interests, but also learning about other cultures too. Love that. Thank you so much. And then Heather, again, same question. How can online Russian educators use culture to build that classroom community and foster the fun and positive online learning environment? Um, well, I, I, I will give a short answer. And I want to say that's really difficult to follow what Olga just said. I mean, I think that is all fantastic. Um, I'm also uh, really trying to, since the war especially, can this ties into Julia's question, um, I'm really trying to focus um, on post-Soviet uh, spaces for our learners to introduce um, the learners to these places, what they are and and um, guide them into, into learning about the, the various cultures in these, these, these places, because I mean, it's definitely not a homogenous space. Um, they are, the cultures are, are quite varied across this space. Um, and you know, part of the reason I do this online and in person is because yeah, our students, we can't send them to Russia or to Ukraine right now to study abroad. And this is a very practical uh, lesson, not just to promote community like in our classes, but to like prepare our students for, for study abroad, for using Russian abroad um, in the spaces that they, they can actually use it. Um, so uh, yeah, that's that's really what I'm, I'm trying to do right now in my classes. Um, I don't wanna, talk too much. I know we're like right at the end. Um, thank you. Well, thank you for that, Heather. And this has been 
perhaps my most favorite OLP series that we've done, and especially working with all of our fantastic panelists. And the crowd here has been amazing. Thank you so much to all of our participants for making this so great. I do just want to quickly draw attention in the chat that Isa put the song they sang in camp on uh, the link to that into the chat. So I will definitely be checking that out at the end of this if anyone wants to uh, check that out and bookmark that. Um, as we wrap up, I quickly want to do uh, the housekeeping. And I want to take everyone back out to our website. I'll put that into the chat. And hopefully everybody has that bookmarked, but this is going to be our uh, website for our series. And I'm hoping that everyone will take the opportunity to earn the digital badge. Um, and Jim and I will be going through and evaluating all of the submissions. But just to walk everyone through what all that entails, and as I said, I do hope a lot of you will pursue this. Um, so the... The badge is basically attending the workshops. Now, if for some reason you had to miss a workshop, if you could please email me, I'll put my email in the chat, uh, but just let me know. If you had to miss one, especially if it was something that was completely out of your control, I know life can sometimes be unpredictable, um, but even if you missed a session or two, maybe we can work around it. But ideally, everybody has attended all three of our, our seminars live. And uh, so you'll want to make sure that you scroll down to the bottom. And we do have the links for everyone. If you want to go check out all the great resources that were shared, there were so many. Uh, but the digital badge criteria is listed at the bottom. So attending our live sessions and participating, as many of you did, um, also, we have our padlets. We'll have the link for that, the 3 to 1 reflection template, and then we have an exit survey as well as some hands on activities. So, as I said, if you are interested in earning the CEU credit, the criteria is here. Um, we can't guarantee it, so please do check with your local LEA or whatever local administrative board that detects what does count for CEU versus what does not. That'll be really important. Um, hopefully we can get you that CEU credit, but if not, at least you can definitely earn the badge. And then uh, the asynchronous tasks are listed here. So there is the Padlet. And the Padlet goes through and lists some of the questions from each of the panel. And we are always curious to see what our participants are taking away and your thoughts on these. So you can find the questions here and go through and answer those with your own thoughts. We're always curious to see what our participants are thinking. And then there is the hands-on activity. So that's gonna be listed here for you. And it will automatically make your own copy. So you can take that, bookmark that if you need to, if you need to come back to it. But in your own copy, it will give all the instructions for the hands-on activities and the idea behind this was to provide some type of artifact that you might be able to use in your own online classroom. I think often we go to webinars like this and professional development series, and sometimes we listen passively and we think, oh, this is a great idea. But then uh, whenever it comes time to implement it, sometimes we don't always do that. So it's my hope that you'll have something to take away from the series and use next year in your own online classroom. And then finally, there is a three to one reflection template. And this is pretty basic, just sharing your thoughts from each of our session. It does make a copy for you. And it's three things that you learn from each session, two things you plan to implement in your own classroom, and then one question you might still have from that particular webinar. Um, and again, there were the three. If you missed any of them, they are also on our YouTube channel for NFLRC. So please feel free to check that out and don't forget to like and subscribe. And then once you're finished with all of those activities uh, down at the bottom of the exit survey, you'll wanna go ahead and complete this. But at the very end of the exit survey, you'll see the opportunity to submit your artifacts for the digital badge. Um, we will be taking submissions for these. So if you could please have these in within about two weeks, I think would be fair. Um, if you need a little bit of extra time, send me an email, let me know. But I think within two weeks, if you can have those components submitted to us, and then we can get you your digital badge, which hopefully you'll be able to use for CEU credit if you need that. And again, we just appreciate everybody's time. Thank you again to all of our panelists. You've all been fantastic. 
and we really appreciate all that you've contributed. And thank you to all of our participants as well for making this such a fun series for us. We really enjoyed this. I'd say this is probably my favorite series yet with NFLRC. So thank you all so much for being part of this. And we will bid you a warm aloha. Please also be sure to check our NFLRC website for any future upcoming activities that we might have for you. Thank you, everyone. Mahalo.